Graduate College. And tonight we're chatting with Eliza Sanders, who is the writer for Corporate and Foundation Giving at the Field Museum in Chicago. Welcome, Eliza. Hello. Good to be here. <laughs> so um, we're going to get started. And I think that uh, I think that Eliza's story is going to interest a lot of people because, Eliza, you're a fairly recent graduate, right, from your PhD program at Iowa. Yes, I just graduated in May 2015. Right. So since May 2015, can you tell us a little bit about what has happened to you? Yes, uh, I moved to Chicago a couple weeks after uh, graduation and for jobs. And I had been applying to jobs for a while and um, interviewed for this position at the Field Museum. Within a month, I, I was starting there. Uh, and now I've been working there for seven months, and it's been great. So did when you were applying for jobs, can you tell us a little bit about the types of jobs that you applied for? Yeah, so I kind of, I really didn't have a specific direction. I was sort of applying to anything that looked like I would like doing it and that they might hire a PhD in English. I I applied for a couple of jobs at Cricket Media, which is a children's publisher here in Chicago. Um, I applied for a job at the Lincoln Park Zoo as an education coordinator. Uh, what else did I apply for? How I applied for a couple of jobs um, at a magazine company that makes sort of business to business publications. Um, I was just trying a lot of different avenues. How did you uh, find those jobs? Um, the, the internet. I mean, I, I looked at Indeed. I looked at, um, you know, just the websites of Chicago institutions. I knew like the Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, I loved, I love zoos. So I thought that would be really great. Uh, and, um, and I looked a little bit at idealist.com, which is a sort of a nonprofit hub for job and volunteer postings. And so you found the position at the Field Muse Museum. You applied. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that process that you went through? Did, I mean, you, you created materials for that, for that well, application. I was very lucky to have pretty much all the materials I need. Um, how that job uh, application came about was I had spent the whole spring pretty much trying to network with people in Chicago. Um, I had come here once in January and once in April for a weekend to have coffee with strangers uh, that I had found through my undergraduate college alumni website. And I basically looked for anyone who had a humanities bachelor's degree and who worked in Chicago. <laughs> Uh, and emailed them out of the blue. The last person that I met with was someone who worked at the Field Museum. And the second we saw each other, we hadn't recognized each other's names, but as soon as I saw her at the field, we realized we'd been in choir together. Um, but we never talked because she was a soprano and I was an alto. And, you know, you're on the other, you're divided by the men. You don't, you don't really talk to each other. So, we were like, oh, it's you. I don't, I remember you. And so we went and had like a two hour coffee. She was sort of on her own, doing her own career transition um, uh, out of nonprofit. And she's now going to school for physical therapy. So she was very sympathetic. And she like, we looked up the Field Museum website on her phone and looked at the careers page. And she just pointed out a couple different positions that I should apply for. She's like, you should apply for this one and this one. And I said, great, and I did, and one of them was the writer job. Um, the, the, my director, ha like it happened to be on her team. Um, uh, her former boss is now my boss. And so she had even taken me kind of down to the basement of the, where the IA offices are, the institutional advancement offices are, and introduced me to a few people. and. Um, and then I sent in, you know, my resume, uh, my cover letter. Two days before I moved to Chicago, like my car was packed. I got, um, she emailed me and said, I think, I think you're going to get a phone interview. Um, and then I found out I, did, I got a phone interview. I think I had that like the first week I was living here. Um, she, 
uh, that was with the the director of my team. Um, then she, at the end of the phone interview, which was about a half an hour, she asked me to schedule an in-person interview and asked me to bring uh, three writing samples. Well, not three. I think she just asked for some writing samples. So I luckily had um, been on the textbook committee when that introduction to the um, the Norton book had been written by the textbook committee, the one that everyone has to use their first semester. So I uh, grabbed the part that I had written, that I contributed. Um, I had the public abstract for my dissertation, which all U of Iowa graduates are now forced to write. Um, and uh, so you all already have that. And then I think I, what was the other one? The, the abstract for a paper to get into a conference. So that one was the most sort of like esoteric, like highbrow kind of piece of writing that I had in the bunch. Um, but it was still for a conference that was like for my entire era of focus. Like it was for all 19th century people, not just people studying 19th century science fiction and religion. So it still kind of had to make it an argument um, for that was understandable by a lot of people. And um, so I brought those in, had an interview with her and my two teammates. Um, then I had a second interview and that was with uh, one of an HR person who asked me HR questions like um, that are kind of like general and not standard to the, or not specific to that job. So those sort of, stereotypical, what are your greatest strengths kind of questions. And, uh, and also sort of the, the dreaded salary question. Uh, and then I had a meeting with another teammate and another director in the institutional advancement team. Uh, and then probably they, they told me they'd tell me a week later and I found out a week later they were checking my references and I had gotten the job. Fantastic. That's very long winded. <laughs> no, sorry. That's, that's perfect. Um, within that actually, uh, I think there's a bunch of questions that sort of come up. So uh, you mentioned networking. Uh, clearly networking is part of your job story, your career path. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us how that how that went for you. That's something that a lot of the folks that I work with struggle with this idea of, I mean, so you said you contacted people out of the blue that you had something in common with. Um, mm -hmm. How were you able to take that step? Um, what did that look like? What did you ask them? Um, well, I had a few phone interviews with people that weren't from my undergraduate college. The ones that were really valuable were the in-person interviews with other alumni. And I'm, I'm just very, very lucky in the fact that I went to a college that has a lot of like, I went to St. Olaf College, if, I don't know, um, it's in Minnesota, has a lot of sort of um, a strong identity, a strong sense of community. Their, our motto is lives of worth and service. So it's sort of like four years of being trained to just help people. Um, and so all of my emails were kind of, you know, I found you on this on the alumni directory. I'm going through a tra career transition. I'm planning on, I am moving to Chicago. Like I was able to say, this is my plan. Um, I would really like to learn more about your career. Would you, could you spare 20 minutes um, for a coffee or a quick conversation? Um, and personally, like, I totally understand why people struggle with networking. I personally found it a more, a way, a way of looking for a job and doing that kind of work and prepping to look for a job easier for my personality than the kind of send 50 page packets in to a bunch of universities. Um, because, uh, and I don't know, that kind of like uh, meeting people that I have a little bit in common with and kind of winning them over is something I really like. Like I did that strengths finder with you and Alex and one of my uh, strengths was woo. And you guys were like, we've never had someone with woo before. 
<laughs> True. <laughs> so, um, I think I, I totally like. I get the idea that it can feel weird, and because we're not we're not trained to uh, to do that kind of reaching out to strangers and and talking about ourselves in a way that's not talking about our work. Um, but the way that kind of I really got comfortable with it was a I realized that if in two years someone asked me for an informational interview I would be flattered out of my mind and like grateful to help someone you know not everyone said yes when I asked them but I think you know when you're working a nine-to-five job you've been around the same people for a really long time you kind of you take it for granted and the chance to like be able to talk about the fact that you are successful and that someone wants to be where you are like is a huge ego boost and a huge way to make yourself feel like you're kind of helping the world um and so that kind of helped when i really looked at it from their position um and i i also kind of you know, thought about the differences between what a university looking for a new professor professor is looking for versus what someone, my, I'm sorry, my cat, go away. <laughs> um, someone looking for a more standard non-academic uh, position is kind of looking for what they're hiring for. And when you're in an office for 40 hours a week next to someone else, I mean, they're hiring kind of like a roommate as much as they are someone who can do the job. Like that's part of the point of networking, whether you think it's okay or wrong or ethical or whatever, that's kind of the way that it works because they want to also know that like you're a pleasant person to be around. You have something in common and it, like, they're, your your boss or your coworker who sits next to you will be seeing you probably more than they see their spouse. So, like, understanding that you are a reasonable, nice human being, especially if you have a PhD. I had numerous people on these networking interviews say, "You've you're you're you've got a PhD." Like, I had someone someone said, "You don't seem like you have a PhD." But and then stop themselves and say, I mean that in like a nice way. But those informational interviews, you kind of have to tread the line between making sure they know you're not asking them for a job. You're honestly just there learning. Um, and you let them do anything more than that. You can't suggest that you're looking for them to help you anything with anything further than information. Um, I kind of I lost my train of thought. I'm sort of rambling here. Um, oh, where was I? You were talking about networking. Yes. Um, treading that line, not looking for anything other than information. Um, oh, but part of what you're doing is um, you're showing them that you're a, a pleasant, smart, good person to be around that even if they can't help you, maybe in a month, their friend will say, we're hiring on my team, do you know anybody? And they'll say, oh, I met this person who is looking for something and she seemed great. You might, you know, I might give you her email or something. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah. the, the very, definition, the, the ideal sort of explanation, uh, particularly for humanists, of how networking, how networking should work. Um, right. Could work in your favor. Um, yeah. So you were talking, uh, so if I go back to where you are with your job, you're talking a little bit about the, mm -hmm. the nine to five-ness. And that's mm -hmm. another area where I know a lot of uh, folks have questions. So can you talk to us a little bit about what um, one of your days looks like or possibly one of your weeks? Um, what, what do you do at the office? Um, well, today, I was thinking about this. I was like, if they ask me what I did today, it's a pretty, it's a pretty great day to talk about. And not every day was like today. But um, today, I learned how to use some online software to create an infographic uh, that represents on a map every place that field museum scientists have gone for research this year. 
Um, I also did some prospect research, which is looking at the histories and giving practices of foundations to see if the if they might fund the field. Um, writing up fact sheets, doing digging, like it feels a little grad schooly. Um, and we are opening an exhibition at the end of this week. So today was the staff preview, which meant we all got to go through the exhibition and then listen to a nice half hour lecture um, about it, about the history, um, a lecture by a couple PhDs. Um, What's the exhibition? It's uh, China, China's first emperor and his terracotta warriors. So um, everyone's very, very excited. So this is our my advertisement. Come to the field and see the terracotta warriors. It's pretty cool. Um, not every day is that exciting. We're not opening the exhibition every day. Uh, some weeks feel uh, a little like grad school in that there's a deadline. Um, and I just, I have to do a lot of writing. I did pretty much no writing today um, in terms of, you know, original content creation. Uh, but some weeks, a lot of what it is is writing to meet a deadline. Um, and the adjustment, one adjustment I've had to make is I'm used to there being pretty much no, no extra step between Eliza thinks it's done and turn it in. <laughs> but now I have, I have a supervisor and a director and um, who have more experience in this genre of writing than I do. So I've had to adjust kind of how I react to deadlines to account for that extra step when they're asking me to do some editing. So in your writing, can you speak to what, what has changed as you're uh, learning this new genre of writing? Mm -hmm. What, how are you, how are you evolving? What's changed is that I have no control over the content, which is tricky. Um, instead of being able to research and find what I think is the most important content or, um, or create my own argument, now my research is going up to the third floor of the museum and interviewing scientists, which has its own reward. You know, for someone who is a little more extroverted, I learning things that I would never know, like or find out through my own research because I, you know, recently to this foundation who was funding one of our postdocs, and I had to go up and ask him how his, you know, work uh, with some Zapodec uh, effigy vessels was going uh, that he got from Oaxaca, Mexico and was sending shipping off these little pieces of them to a lab in Washington DC in order to analyze the clay. Like there's no reason, I don't know anything about that. So there's a lot of sort of um, starting from scratch and realizing I, I'm kind of never the expert anymore, which like there's a give and take there. There's like one of my questions uh, when I was interviewing for the job was, Give us an example of how you handled a disagreement or a conflict when you were not the content expert. And that was a hard question because I was in the last year of my PhD and I was like, all I do is teach and write this dissertation. Like I am the content expert. Um, I had to kind of think back to being in my prospectus uh, with my committee and problems that they raised and, um, Things like that. So that's been the writing for a, a different audience, a non-academic audience is a big change. But as I kind of said in my cover letter to get the job, I'm still writing to persuade, which is what you're doing in academic writing. It's just you're persuading, in fundraising, you're persuading them to um, believe in you enough to donate <laughs> and to support um, this uh, this mission that you believe in. So uh, something that's always so noticeable every time that I talk to you, Eliza, is your sort of your enthusiasm, your energy, and it just it's sort of infectious. It kind of comes across in in really <laughs> nice ways. Um, 
do you feel like, I guess what I almost want to say is, do you feel like part of your personality matches the work that you're doing now? Or have you evolved to match the work you're doing now? Um, you convey so much energy about the place that you work. You seem to really like it. <laughs> um, that's good, because uh, I do. Um, I think a little of both, probably. I, part of the reason I decided to look for a job outside academics was part, I mean, partly it's the reason probably everyone is considering that. The job market is terrible. Um, but it was also a personality thing that I realized about myself. I realized I was much more extroverted than a lot of the people in my, um, it, who were also in my PhD program. Um, and I realized I, I just really need structure in my, in my day to day and in my week. Um, I was just feeling incredibly sort of unhinged from the world. And while some people get a lot of energy from that, I found it really draining. Um, so I think that part, you know, was already ready to kind of have this sort of job. Now that I have been at it for seven months, I realize it, it is taking me a while to like to adjust to a nine to five schedule, um, to, to have less time just lying around that is flexible. Um, and you know, and there are things that I do miss about academics like I, I miss some of those days of teaching that were really good and energizing and when I just got to talk about the stuff that I know better than anybody else um, but I've also found ways to sort of compensate for that like I mean people tease me about it now but within the first month of working at the field I started a book club and <laughs> And everyone was like, people have been talking about starting a field book club for so long. Thank you for finally doing it. Um, and that's been another way that like, I've created internal relationships that, um, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, my future roommate is someone who works in PR on the second floor who's in the book club. Um, and, uh, and I probably wouldn't have met him. Um, and so I'm, I'm meeting people in different departments. And I'm also getting that sort of bookishness part of my personality out. So does that answer your question? I, it, it I does feel like I'm rambling question. a lot. No, you're not. You're not rambling. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, th but what you said kind of reminds me of uh, this, you know, this common feeling of kind of needing to transition your identity from an academic identity to uh, a non-academic identity. Um, and what I would almost describe that I've seen with uh, with students um, after they've graduated and sort of when they're searching for jobs or starting a non-academic job as a period of, of mourning. It doesn't sound like mourning with you <laughs> particularly, but um, but it's certainly challenging. So, uh, you know, how much how much of the academic self do you keep? How much, you know, uh, how does that work? And uh, I'd love to hear more about it, actually, from you. Um, well, I guess this might be a good place to, to insert um, that I'm getting my dissertation published as a book. So I feel like that part of my academic self is very much alive. And when I was editing the manuscript, I realized kind of like how much I'd already put that part of me behind me. Like, it was hard to even look at that dissertation again and like be thinking in that kind of academic speak when I, I've been so used to writing grant proposals. Um, and I, I feel really good about the fact that that section of my life is going to live on, that like, that it will be out there um, in book form. Uh, I, I'm also doing something in a couple weeks um, that's based on my sort of academic background. The field does something called cinema science, where um, at this uh, little indie, beautiful actually movie theater called The Music Box, they show a movie and they have a scientist talk about the movie. So they've done like Jurassic Park and Jaws and those kinds of things and have, you know, our marine biology expert go talk about it. Um, when I got the book deal, my boss suggested that I find a scientist and team up with him 
and do it. And I was sort of like, oh, they don't want me flaunting my English PhD around in this science <laughs> institution. <laughs> um, but the person in charge of cinema science was in my book club. And I just floated the idea by him. He said, I might know someone who'd want to do that. And um, now we're going, uh, me and a meteorologist, we're going to show a movie I used to teach all the time, Prometheus. Uh, and we're doing that in a couple weeks. So he's going to talk about the science behind it. And I'm going to talk about the science fictional and religious aspects of the movie. So in one way, I am lucky in that I'm really finding ways to continue having that academic part of my personality. I work in a building filled with PhDs, not necessarily in a department filled with PhDs. I'm the only PhD, I think, in my department. But it's a place that really, really values that kind of um, that kind of work and that kind of mindset. Um, I think in terms of my own morning, like, I don't know that I've really experienced that and I can really understand, um, I can understand people experiencing that a lot, especially if you really knew that you had wanted to be a professor and you felt that the only thing kind of, that the only barrier between you and that goal was the time in which we're living. <laughs> and this horrible job market. Um, but a year and a half before I finished my dissertation and I was able to decide I am never gonna go on this job market. I'm just gonna try and find something else. I felt such a, just a sense of relief um, that I don't know that I really, <laughs> that I really mourned. Um, I think I'm someone who I don't have a whole ton of like, this sounds horrible because I mean, I have a PhD, but I don't know that I have a, an incredible amount of career ambition in me. Um, I wanna be very good at what I do and I want to feel good about what I'm doing. And, um, and that it's a, like that I'm performing a worthy activity every day. But I think what's just as important to me are like my own sense of balance in my life. Um, my own sense of just like feeding all the different parts of my personality. Um, one thing that's like completely come back that I completely lost was the love of reading. Um, like I just started my first Victorian novel <laughs> since finishing my PhD. Um, and I have a book goal for this year. I've already, in 2016, I've already read six books. Um, and I like sit at work looking forward to reading. And I'd completely lost that. And I realized that I feel, I feel more like me. And I had not realized how like, not like me I had gotten to feel. Um, in the PhD program, which is very confusing because I love to read. And so the clearly as an undergrad, the path seemed to be, well, obviously you should be an English professor. Um, but I think what not enough people consider when they're an undergrad and thinking about careers is not what sub, not, not just what subject you're passionate about, but also what do you need every day? Like, what do you need your lifestyle to be? And I don't think I thought about that. Um, but that's hard to think about when you're in college. Uh, yeah, but I, so, so balancing those two things, what I love versus what I want my lifestyle to be um, has kind of led me to this place and made me feel good about it. So what, um, what if anything, um, would you have told that younger self? What was, is there anything that could have convinced her to, to think about that balance? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would have listened. Um, and the other thing that's hard is I realized if I had just left college with just an English major, which is all that I had, I didn't double major or minor, I probably really would have struggled. I would not have this job that I have now. You, you know, I, I I would have had, I could have spent those early 20s years in 
much more frustrating positions than being in a PhD program and teaching English. Um, so in many ways, like that is a, is a fortunate part of doing the PhD for me. So, uh, so it sounds to me like uh, as a professional, having the PhD has a strong impact on your life, whether it's confidence or uh, can you articulate what do you what do, is that for you that having the PhD, even though you're not working in an academic position, mm -hmm. having the PhD has as an effect on your life? Obviously, it has you in the position you're in. Right. Yeah, I think it gives me a credibility in terms of writing, even though I still have to go through a lot of editing um, because I'm I'm still learning this world. Um, I think. It helps me in this specific job because I talk to a lot of people with PhDs and I, they have to extend a level of trust to the development department to be able to communicate what they're spending their lives doing to donors who have no experience in that. Um, I think that me coming from an academic background maybe helps me be able to understand that position and n navigate that relationship. Um, I think it gives me a lot of uh, hope and excitement for maybe 10 or 20 years down the road um, when I have the amount of experience um, that others have in this field, but I also have a PhD. Um, you know, I, I look around at the people who are the CEOs of huge, um, you know, artistic and educational institutions in Chicago, and they have PhDs. Um, the CEO of the Field Museum has a PhD in Sanskrit. He used to be a professor. Um, the CEO of the Shedd Aquarium has a has a PhD from Iowa. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so uh, while maybe, you know, if I'd somehow gotten right into development right out of undergrad, I would be in a higher position than I am right now. Um, I think so. So at times it can feel like like doing that career transition can make you feel like you're a bit behind where you could have been. Um, but I think having the PhD in in a, couple, a decade or two will be a real leg up. Um, and an advantage. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's that I, I agree with you. And I, I think in thinking about the long game about career change and, and what you can do to leverage that over time. Are there specific things that, um, you know, I guess I would say PhD students are often interested in transferable skills and how to market themselves. Mm -hmm. Are there specific things in your degree programs that you felt like were more transferable to the position that you're in now? And were you able to sort of leverage these um, either in your interview or in your daily life now? Um, yes, certainly. I mean, the obvious one is writing because my position is a writer, um, which makes me really just think for a kind of entry level position uh, after a PhD in English, a grant writer, like you could do worse than being a grant writer and learning the world of fundraising. Um, certainly writing, I think um, being able to talk about your teaching as a way of managing. Um, people don't think of it as managing, but you have had like, you have had control over the goings on of a group of 25 people for a semester. Um, you have decided what's best for them to learn. You have dealt with a lot of conflict. So um, how you deal with conflict is an incredibly common interview question. And, you know, like it or not, <laughs> teaching at Iowa, we've all had, we've all, we all have great stories about how we've dealt with conflict. Um, in our classes and that can that can be a really wonderful illustration of um, your personality and um, that you're used to running up against personality differences and other kinds of common issues in an office 
I think that's one of the things people are a little wary of when they're interviewing a PhD is, but they've never worked in an office, like, which seems like such a not like a non concern. But, you know, if, if they're if you, like me, I had just I had gone into the PhD program directly out of undergrad. I'd never worked in an office for more than three months. Um, they want to know that you're going to be OK doing it. And so thinking about how different experiences in your PhD can transfer, not just for the skills, but also just for like the day to day existence of being in a nine to five office can be helpful. So we were chatting a little bit uh, before the session started, um, and we talked a little about the nine to five piece. Um, and I know that that's something that, you know, the piece that you're bringing up now, that, that students are worried about what that nine to five looks like. Are you sitting down in your chair uh, the whole day? Do you never get to move around? It sounds like you're describing something in a day where you move around quite a bit. Is yeah, yeah. I mean, it really depends on the day. On a day when something's due at five, I'm sitting in my chair, but that's no different than finals week <laughs> um, in a PhD program. And I sat in my chair more, like, than in finals. You know, like, I had days in my PhD program where I did not open my front door for 48 hours. That, no matter how crunched you are, that can't possibly happen in a nine to five job. <laughs> You have to move from one building to the other. Um, but on some days, you know, I uh, like today, uh, we had that lecture and we had the exhibition opening. Um, I often uh, will have to go to the third floor if I'm working on a report uh, or a proposal that I need a scientist's um, perspective on. Um, I you know, at times I will take a break. I did this a lot early on so I could learn the museum. Um, I could take a break, a 20 minute break in the afternoon and like, if I just need to clear my head and go walk an exhibit. Um, you know, I mean, most of the time we have lunch there in the building, but every so often, like once a week, we might go off site. Um, there's less options on museum campus than maybe in the loop, but we have, everyone has very firm opinions about whether the aquarium, the planetarium, or the field have the best food. <laughs> and you choose? <laughs> uh, the planetarium. They have, they have a really good buffalo chicken salad. <laughs> <laughs> We're going this summer, so uh, I'll, I'll just check it Yeah, out. <laughs> I would, yeah, for, I mean, for exhibits, I have to, I have to say the field, but, um, but lunch at the planetarium. Lunch at the planetarium. <laughs> yeah. So um, in, uh, in, in closing, I want to draw this back for just a moment to um, the graduate students that will be watching this. And okay. uh, any advice that you might have for them um, that, you know, right now, if they're looking at you, watching you, thinking, wow, that sounds like a really interesting career path. That sounds exciting. That might fit me. What should they be doing now? You should be, I mean, uh, thinking about for you, what's the best way to meet people? Um, have a way to direct your kind of networking. Like I had, I decided I wanted to move to Chicago. Yours might be, I really want to go into this specific kind of career path. Um, have some way to narrow that, but, um, but also be have your ears open for anyone you can network with. If you don't have this undergrad situation that I did, um, ask ask your friends, ask family members who maybe you haven't talked to in a little while if they know anybody, or um, you know, just people will come out of the woodwork and that you never knew about. I mean, I have a. I, my stepsister's half-brother lives here in Chicago. I didn't know about him until I moved here. But now, like, we have a great relationship. Like, things just kind of happen once you put your feelers out there and are clearly looking for people. Um, have some things that are readable to a non-expert audience. Um, they can be about your, your uh, area of study, but someone needs to be able to see that 
that writing skill is transferable to what they need you to write. Um, so it needs to have, even if it's about your element of study, it needs to have some sort of characteristics that they can see in a future, say, grant proposal or something like that. Um, I think, you know, do, do, do some thinking about what you value and what your personality sort of needs and craves. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are still doing that strengths finder thing. Um, we but, do it with individuals. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to I, go back to doing it with a group. I found that helpful. Um, you know, something that was really revealing was, I don't know if your, your listeners might, might not know, but so strengths finder, um, you find your top five things that make you feel good and like that you feel like talented doing. Um, and they're sorted into colors. And one of them is like the achievement color. Uh, and everyone <laughs> in, our, in my group in this doctoral program had at least one blue, except my best friend and I. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, what does that mean? And mine were mostly relational and um, an intellection. I think that was the other one. But three out of my five were all about people and relationships. Um, and I thought, you know, the thing that makes me feel good is not necessarily individual achievement, which is what a lot of academia is based on in the humanities. We're not like the scientists that I talk to all the time who everything they write is co-written. They have intense partnerships with people in the lab. Like we just don't, we're not in a field that that kind of, that's open as open to that. Um, and so just figuring out who you are and being okay with it and realizing I didn't fail. I just did what most people do in their twenties, which is figure out who they are. <laughs> Other people don't have to do it in a PhD program, but we did, and it's okay. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Uh, three uh, terrific pieces of advice. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. What an absolute pleasure it was to talk to you. Thank um, you, Dan. And uh, I'll, I'll be in touch again soon, I'm sure. Okay, great. <laughs> sending things your way or, uh, you know, asking you for things to send the way of our students, but uh, we so value the connection um, with you and uh, obviously so incredibly proud that, that Iowa graduates are doing such cool things in the world. So thank you and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You can do it. <laughs>